Welcome to English Practice Stories. My mother has always hated psychic mediums. The school thought I was autistic. They called that a gift too. My mother taught me how to control myself. Now, she wasn't teaching me how to become some crime-fighting psychic detective or superhero or anything cool like that. She taught me how to live without clawing my hair out every day. I learned how to silence the voices, to read minds only when I wanted to, and to mingle the rest with background noise. She taught me how to interpret my dreams and separate the nonsense possibilities from the dreadful certainties. Most importantly, however, she was teaching me not to pretend I don't know more about people than what they have already told me and not finish their sentences for them. I used to do that a lot. Again, the school chalked it up to autism. The gift of an atypical mind. She taught me well, but I never had a chance to learn it all. I remember that day well. I was in algebra class, and we were in the middle of a test when I felt it. It was like an ocean of dread washing over me. I knew right then and there what had happened. I dropped my pencil, and I walked out of the classroom. I could hear my heart thumping in my chest as I made my way to the principal's office, sitting in a nearby chair that I found myself in almost every week. Dylan, please come to the principal's office, I heard over the loudspeaker, already opening the door when he began to speak. I caught Principal Gallard with his hand still on the microphone, the shock evident on his face. He said quite a few very cruel things in his head about the weird kid before being overcome with a wave of guilt for the thought. I didn't mind, Mom had taught me not to judge people for their intrusive thoughts. My mother is dead. I said before that he could have a chance to speak. He avoided eye contact, and his cheeks reddened. Uh, no, no no no. She's. He stuttered. She's just been hurt, kid. I don't know how bad it is, but she's on her way to the hospital. The police are on their way to bring you there. I'm sure she will be okay. She wasn't. She was dead before she reached the hospital, and I never got to say goodbye. There's an old joke about charlatan psychics failing to foresee disasters as proof that they are frauds. The truth is more complicated than that. We have constant premonitions of our own demise. Our dreams show us every possible tragedy, but not every likely tragedy. Sometimes we see something useful, like knowing when to take extra care before crossing a street because a drunk driver is coming or when your friend won't get the joke and you'll make an ass of yourself if you say it. Most of the time, however, they are wild, impractical situations that would never happen. The random thugs rob the restaurant your mother works at and shoot her nine times for $150 in the register, dreams come almost weekly. You tend to filter them out as nonsense, and you ironically never see them coming. I never met another person like us after she died. I was sent to live with my father's parents. I could always sense the brightness of my mother's soul, shining with the strength of her gift. 
If normal souls glowed like candles in the dark, she was a light bulb, shining brighter than a hundred normal people combined. I never met my father, but she said he was just like her. Wherever he got the gift, it was not from my grandparents. Grandma was just a normal candle, and Grandpa, well, bless his soul, but he was more like a match. One of those soft ones from the little cardboard books they used to light pipes. They did well enough to raise me, but they had nothing to teach me. I doubt they even understood what it was, and I was not about to tell them. Mom said not to trust anyone who wasn't like me, not even family. The years moved on, I grew up, and I was always alone. I had friends, of course, and I even dated here or there. Even when I was surrounded by people who cared about me, there was always the lingering fact that nobody was quite like me. Nobody to relate to. Nobody to talk to. And, although it pains my ego to admit it, nobody has taught me more about the gift. I don't know what else my mother was saving for later in life, but something tells me the education was not meant to end at 12 years old. I guess that's why I've always had a thing for psychic readings. I tell myself it's because I find them funny. Seeing people pretend to have what I have and make a poor show of it makes me feel special, especially when I use the gift to trip them up. The truth is that, beneath it all, I think I am just looking for another. Mom said real psychics don't sell the gift for $20 a pop but I have been a broke college student, and I know how tempting it can be. I feel shame at the thought of it, but I did do a handful of parlor tricks among friends when I was running especially low. Just for ramen money, and I always acted like there was a reasonable explanation. I can understand why someone might stoop lower than that if they were desperate enough. My interest in meeting new psychic mediums to humiliate is why I agreed to go out with my co-workers last weekend. I'm always up for a chance to find and embarrass another scammer. He wants to invite me to the winter fair, I thought as Jason approached my desk on Friday. Hey Dylan, some of us were planning on going to the fair this weekend. Wanna come? I had time to consider the offer before it was made. Maybe all will be there. I asked as if I didn't already know. Just you, me, Bob, Sarah, and Jane. He said. They are all good colleagues, and Jason is almost a friend, but I was the most interested in Jane's presence. She always has the most mushy intrusive thoughts whenever I look at her, and I would be a liar if I were to say I wasn't at least open to them. And so the weekend came, and we went off to see the fair. Ice sculptures, children skating on a frozen pond, out-of-season Christmas decorations, the works. I was delighted to read a brochure advertising that a psychic booth was set up on the opposite side of the grounds for some woman named Madame LeBeau, but I had barely read the words when I was struck by a sensation I had never felt in my life. It was like when you stepped out of a dark room and into the sunlight. The eye behind my eyes was momentarily blinded, and my temple felt like I was struck on the forehead by a hammer. Uh, yeah, I'd like that, Jason. Would you like a, oh, uh, yeah, 
I'll get you a hot chocolate. Jason said, asking a question I had already answered. I haven't slipped up like that in months, but my mind was out of focus. Across the grounds, in what I assume was the psychic's tent, was a soul more intense than any I had seen before. My mother was a light bulb among candles, but this Madame Lebeau, as I assumed she must be, felt like a lighthouse beacon in the fog. I was drawn to it like a moth to a flame. I pushed my friends away, and I walked through the snow. I ignored the people around me, their bodies and their minds, to push through them on the straightest path. This soul drew me closer with each step, as if guiding my way through booths, sculptures, and crowds. Soon I could see her tent, just as tacky as all of the others I had seen, but I just knew, deep within, that all my questions were about to be answered. That all of my problems were moments away from being erased. My thoughts for the first time in forever were calm and set on one path. And then I was sucker punched in the back of the head. I lost concentration. I fell into the snow. I could hear the thoughts of those around me, a dozen strangers wondering what had just happened. Why had that woman just assaulted me out of nowhere? I looked up at my assailant, and I saw her standing over me. She was winded, as if she had run to me from a great distance, and her hand was still balled in a fist. She was around my age, with red hair and piercing green eyes. Her soul grew before my eyes. I had never seen a soul change, or, as I quickly realized, I had never seen my own perception of a soul change. She had the gift, and she was looking at me as if I had grown three eyes. What the hell are you doing? I heard her voice in my mind. My mother taught me to speak without speaking, and she only used it in emergencies. Why aren't you cloaking? It sees you. What? Cloaking? What are you talking about? I asked sheepishly, my mind still in a daze. Who was this woman, and why did she distract me from meeting Madame Lebeau? Her face changed to an expression of confusion, followed by understanding. She grabbed my head and turned my face back to the tent. The light was still there but now I could see what had fallen beneath my perception before. It was wrong. I had been blinded by its intensity and had missed the putrid rot that permeated the light. The light was malignant, and now that I had broken free, it was angry. I was pulled to my feet and running before I knew what was happening. The girl led me through the crowds, her baleful eye glaring into my soul as we ran. For the first time in my life, I realized that there might be a damn good reason why I have never met anyone else like me. If you like our story, subscribe English Practice Stories channel and click the bell icon.